Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Lunch with a Scientist. I'm Leia with Headwaters Science Institute. And if you are tuning in for the first time, this is, of course, a series designed for you to get to know a professional person in science and understand some of their research and what their career looks like. So today, I am very excited to welcome Christine Grayson. She's an associate professor in the biology department at the University of Richmond. She received an NSF International Research Fellowship to Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand for her research on Tuatara, an endemic reptile. And one of her claims to fame is capturing the state record for holding snapping turtle for North Carolina, 52 pounds. Um, in her, uh, in addition to her passion for amphibian and reptile conservation, Dr. Grayson's current work also examines the spread potential of the gypsy moth, an invasive forest pest in North America. So we're very excited to welcome Dr. Christine Grayson. Hi, good morning, Christine, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Thanks so much for the invitation to be here today. You're very welcome. We're so excited to hear your talk and I've seen some of your slides. You've got great pictures and we're gonna learn about some cool reptiles today. So thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you again for having me and I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you guys about a research project I did in New Zealand several years ago as a postdoctoral fellow with the University of uh, Victoria in Wellington. I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy uh, in these times. And it's a real pleasure to connect with you, even if it's uh, just virtually. So I wanted to start by talking about some of the amazing biodiversity in New Zealand, because I'm sure you guys have seen it on nature shows and other uh, opportunities uh, like that. And when you think of animals and plants in New Zealand, what often comes to mind is the iconic kiwi or the New Zealand silver fern as um, animals and plants that are found in New Zealand, but nowhere else in the world. And when it comes to really cool endemic birds, kiwi isn't the only claim to fame that New Zealand has. One of the other really cool species you can find there is the kakapo, which is a giant flightless nocturnal parrot. And it's not just birds in New Zealand, it's also reptiles and insects. And one really cool insect example is a giant cricket they have there called the weta. And if you've ever seen, you know, a small series of movies called The Lord of the Rings, you may have heard of the studio that designed all of the sound effects and um, visual effects that were in those Lord of the Wing Rings movies. Well, the name of that studio is called The Weta Workshop, and it's named after this really cool species of cricket found nowhere else in the world. And there are lots of different species of Weta um, all throughout New Zealand. So how did New Zealand end up with so much biodiversity? It's a story similar to a lot of islands all over the world that are special or that have special kinds of organisms on those islands like the Galapagos or Madagascar. And it's really about time for isolated evolution. Oh, I also wanted to tell you about this uh, creature, this another flightless bird that's not around anymore, the moa, uh, which was found in uh, New Zealand when the first human settlers arrived. And as you can imagine, uh, the moa made for a very tasty protein source for those early human settlers. And so they went extinct on the island of New Zealand as well as several other species that were associated such with the moa, such as the um, eagle, giant eagles that were its predators. So just like you have mammoths and saber-toothed tigers and other parts of the world that have gone extinct. You have some pretty incredible um, extinct animals uh, that lived in New Zealand um, hundreds or thousands of years ago. And this is just a diversity of all the different kinds of animals you can find uh, in New Zealand today. And what's unique about a lot of these animals is that you, what you don't see in this picture. So what you don't see in this picture are snakes or terrestrial mammals. And because New Zealand was isolated for over 800 mil million years, you have this incredible diversity of organisms that evolved in this location that are found nowhere else in the world. And one of the unique features of New Zealand was not having these uh, terrestrial predators until about a thousand years ago. And that's when the first human settlers arrived. And New Zealand was one of the last um, pieces of land 
in the world that was colonized uh, by humans. And about a thousand years ago, uh, the Polynesians arrived from other island nations around uh, New Zealand and they brought with them on their ships, uh, the Pacific rat. And that was one of the first introduced mammals uh, that we think about in New Zealand. And then, like I said, those initial settlers um, hunted some species like moa uh, to extinction um, in the early um, years of human settlement. And then um, after about another uh, uh, 500, 800 years, uh, the Europeans arrived. So Captain Cooks uh, was the first European settler in New Zealand in 1769. It's part of a voyage that um, circumvented the globe. And the voyage of Captain Cook left additional non-native species in New Zealand, such as the Norway rat, goats, pigs, and dogs. And these are just a few examples of the species that have been brought by humans over time to New Zealand. And over time, this included over 50 different species of mammals. And to this day, about 30 of them are still established and causing issues uh, for um, the species in New Zealand. Uh, things like house mice, cats, dogs, um, and mammal predators, um, some of which are native to Australia, like stoats um, and possums, and other interesting species that uh, humans brought with them as well. So there were 10 Canadian moose that were released in 1910. We can't find uh, moose anymore in New Zealand, or at least it's believed the last individual uh, moose was shot in New Zealand in 1952, but it's kind of like the New Zealand Bigfoot. And uh, some people think that if you look hard enough, you still might find uh, moose lurking in the mountains of New Zealand somewhere. But aside from those fun examples, um, the predators are the ones that cause the real carnage. Um, so both house cats and feral cats, as well as species like weasels and stoats and ferrets and possums um, that have found a whole host of species that were really easy to hunt and eat because they had never evolved the anti-predator mechanisms um, that other species that have a long evolutionary history with uh, terrestrial mammal predators, predators do. The only species of mammals that are native uh, originally to New Zealand are a species of bat that you would expect uh, has flown over from other islands and the marine mammals that might visit the shore of New Zealand, like porpoises and whales, uh, for example. So as you can imagine, hundreds of years of these mammal species unchecked has resulted in a lot of devastation to native New Zealand wildlife. So over 30 different species of birds have gone extinct, including all those incredible large species like moa. Um, there have been a huge impact, particularly to flightless species. Uh, a lot of insects have uh, found themselves very highly um, predated, including the Weta example I showed in the first slide, and that largest species of Weta, the giant Weta, is now extinct on the two main islands of New Zealand. The wonderful reptile I went there to study, Tuatara, is now also extinct on the two main islands. Three of seven frog species went extinct, and two of those species that remain are only found on a single offshore island each. Additionally, uh, humans cause other impacts to the landscape of New Zealand. So this is a beautiful uh, landscape view of New Zealand, something that you might see on a tourism poster with the bucolic rolling hills. But in actuality, uh, this landscape uh, shows land that's been cleared for agriculture. So you can see those sheep breeding, breeding sorry, those sheep grazing. Um, and you can see those planted hills of pines, which are non-native species of tree, and they're all the same monoculture of uh, pines that are grown for wood pulp and pulp uh, and wood products. What a native New Zealand forest looks like is something like this. So the native um, flora of New Zealand is just as special as the animal examples I showed, uh, kind of like the Pacific Northwest of the United States, a cool climate uh, rainforest that's um, quite wet and you have these incredible species of moth, and lichens and ferns, and even these giant, uh, exceptionally large examples of uh, ferns that you see in the pictures here. So again, before humans cut down and cleared all that land for agriculture and planting, this is what a native New Zealand forest looks like. 
So what's a country to do when you have a really clear landscape that's basically full of invasive mammal predators? And I know this isn't exactly the take home message the New Zealand Tourism Bureau is going with, but I think it's important when we look at these beautiful vistas that we recognize that a lot of them are the result of these really large um, impacts that humans have had to the landscape, both in New Zealand and all across uh, the world. So what's a country to do? Well, Thankfully, a few remnants of New Zealand biodiversity still exist in all these offshore islands. As I mentioned, there are two main islands of New Zealand, the North Island and the South Island, and these are where uh, the majority of people live. But there are also these offshore islands that have served as safe havens and refuges for the biodiversity that was once spread all across, up and down uh, the two main islands of New Zealand. And thankfully, um, these islands have either remained predator-free or conservation officers have gone to great lengths to protect them and either eradicate predators when they show up on these islands or keep them safe um, in their original state. And there's all kinds of cool examples of biodiversity that's remained safe and hidden on these offshore islands. One example that got a lot of press was an insect called the Lord Howe stick insect, which was one of those species that was thought extinct. Uh, the headline in the New York Times uh, jokingly called it a tree lobster because of its ginormous size. Um, and it remained on this teeny tiny spit of rock that was offshore, hidden safe away in the crevices of that rock and safe from introduced predators. And you can imagine the excitement of the uh, conservation officers that went to great lengths to scale and survey this piece of rock to look for the species that were still remaining there and to come away finding the Lord Howell stick insect was an incredible find. And there are examples uh, like this all the time where these hidden pockets of biodiversity have remained and uh, people go to great lengths to try to uh, protect and reestablish that biodiversity. The other thing that's happening in New Zealand is a big effort on the main two islands to create either refuges that are fenced where those invasive uh, mammal predators are removed. And there's a large scale effort to think about whether the entire two main islands of New Zealand could be predator free uh, by 2050, which is a really lofty goal, uh, but it's an impressive commitment that, that people are trying to think about ways to restore biodiversity in New Zealand on a large scale. So again, one of the fascinating species that remains in New Zealand on these offshore islands is the tuatara, um, which is a native species of reptile found in New Zealand and nowhere else in the world. And you can see by these little white dots in the 80s and 90s, the only populations that remained of tuatara were these offshore islands uh, with no mainland populations remaining. So what kind of reptile is the tuatara? It's a question I get all the time because it kind of looks like a large iguana or lizard. But what's particularly special about this species is it's an entire branch of the reptile evolution tree of life that's found nowhere else on the planet today. So it has split off from other groups of reptiles about 220 million years ago and has morphological features and special characteristics that aren't found in any other group of reptiles. So if we look at the diversity of reptiles on our planet today, we can see there are about 23 different species of crocodiles. We can see about 300 different species of turtle, several thousand species of lizards and snakes, which are in the same um, reptile family and only one species of tuatara left. And so it represents a particularly special branch of evolutionary history, um, and was, which is one of the reasons it's special. It's also special because it has an important place in traditional knowledge and culture of the native uh, Maori people of New Zealand. Um, so that's another reason that uh, people in New Zealand are really interested in making sure this species sticks around for a long time. In addition to the morphological and skeletal features that you don't see in a lot of other reptiles, it has a couple of characteristics that are particularly unique. They are long lived, like some species of turtles. Uh, they wait a long time before they have offspring, so it takes 10 to 20 years for them, for them to mature and reproduce. And then they only lay eggs sometimes, every two to five years, up to 10 years in some populations. So you can imagine how something like an introduced predator could really devastate this population quite quickly. Unlike a lot of species of lizards, these guys are adapted to the cool climates of New Zealand, and they're largely nocturnal, and so they're very active at night. 
One of the other features of Tuatara that's similar to other reptiles is it has a particular type of sex determination called temperature-dependent sex determination, or TSD. We think about mammals or birds, we often think about those XY sex chromosomes that determine uh, what biological sex uh, an individual is at birth. And we know a lot more now about how biological sex works and how the interactions of the XY sex chromosomes and hormones produce the diversity of uh, different kinds of sex expression that we see in nature. And in a lot of species, there aren't even these XY sex chromosomes. So for a species like Tuatara, as well as a lot of different reptiles like crocodiles, you may have heard about this in, the temperature of the nest determines the biological sex of the offspring. Um, and so there are different patterns of how this works. And so this uh, diagram here shows a hypothetical uh, reptile nest where you might have warmer temperatures at the top of the nest, intermediate temperatures in the middle of the nest, and cooler temperatures at the bottom of the nest. Or you might have nests that are laid in cool places or warm places. And different species have different patterns on how biological sex relates to temperature. So in some species, at high temperatures, you get uh, more males produced. At some species, you get more females produced at warmer temperatures. And in some species like crocodiles, you get females produced at the extreme warm and cool temperatures and males produced at intermediate temperatures. And this pattern of sex determination is found in all kinds of uh, species. It's found in all tuatara and crocodiles. It's really prevalent in turtles, uh, it's less frequent in lizards and some fish. Uh, but right now we don't know of any examples in birds, uh, snakes or mammals of temperature dependent sex determination. So the pattern that Tuatara have is this first example, which we don't find a lot of species that have this female to male pattern of temperature dependent sex determination. And this is what this pattern looks like in Tuatara. This is called type 1B temperature dependent sex determination or the female to male pattern, where at cool temperatures, you get females produced from nests. And interestingly for Tuatara, it's a really narrow temperature range where you get that transition to all male offspring produced. About 21, between 21 and 22 degrees Celsius is where you see that transition between female offspring and male offspring. So you might be thinking then about our global patterns in temperature and what species like temperature dependent, like species like Tuatara that have temperature dependent sex determination might be facing under climate change. So we know we see global increases in temperatures all around the world. And this can have really big impacts for species with temperature dependent sex determination where the temperature is changing at rates unlike any we have seen um, on this planet before. And for species like Tuatara that's stuck on these offshore islands, like this one here, for example, there's not a lot of space to move around and find, let's say, a cooler place to nest or a different kind of habitat to nest. Uh, so this was the kind of research questions I was interested in when I started my position at Victoria University in Wellington. And I worked with a group headed by Dr. Nicola Nelson um, in the Tuatara research group. And they had observed in the 90s that this particular island that is shown here called North Brother Island was already starting to see a male bias sex ratio in the population where over time researchers had noticed that more and more individuals in the population were male. So this was the research that I set out to follow up on in the project that I did in New Zealand. And so what I did was I first gathered all the uh, capture records for species on this island. So this island has been surveyed over multiple years, going all the way back to 1988, um, through the time that I was doing my project there in early 2010, 2012, 2011. And so I was able to add a few more data points to this data set and compare to see how sex ratio had changed over time. And so you can see early in the 90s, the sex ratio on this island was about 62.5% males. And in the more recent decades that this island has been surveyed, it goes all the way up to about 71% males on this island. 
And so we wanted to look a little bit more about what the outlook was going to be for this population if this pattern uh, continued and what factors were driving um, the increase in the number of males in this population. Is it just nest temperature or are there other factors that impact what this population is going to look like into the future? And so it turns out there's a lot of factors involved, not just the temperatures of nests. It, uh, in, and we looked at each of these mechanisms individually. So we looked at how male and female tuatara had changed in things like body condition and the amount of food they were eating. We looked at temperature models of the island to predict uh, what the offspring sex ratio was gonna be for nests that were produced. We looked at uh, decreases in fecundity and reproductive frequency in collaboration with a researcher at the University of Western Australia named Nicola Mitchell. And we projected out what uh, these uh, populations might look like over time as uh, the number of um, male individuals increased over time. And uh, looked ahead to see that in about 150 years, this island might have an all-male population. The good news is this is a really long list species and we have a lot of time um, given how long it lives and how frequently it reproduces to think about what uh, conservation solutions might be possible to reverse this trend of um, male bias sex ratio. We're also interested to see this as a case study since there are lots of different populations of tuatara what's going to happen in the future? Are there mechanisms where this population uh, might make adjustments over time to correct this imbalance in sex ratio? The other part of the project I did when I was there was to see if the problems that we were seeing on North Brother Island and the skew in sex ratio was happening in, happening in other um, island populations. So my job was really tough. I had to go travel around to a lot of different Tuatara populations and visit some of these remnant island populations where you have to be really careful about making sure your impact is really minimal to the environment because so many important species are housed on these islands. We had to undergo quarantines to make sure that we weren't bringing any um, uh, pests or other invasive species onto these islands. And we went, uh, through some of these places and did nocturnal surveys looking uh, for the numbers of tuatara and the sex ratios that we captured in the surveys we did. And as you can see uh, from the picture on the bottom, uh, our camping uh, conditions were pretty primitive. Uh, again, we were trying to keep our footprint as low as possible to get to survey some of these really uh, special islands and places. And the good news is across the islands that I surveyed off the top of the northern uh, coast of New Zealand, as well as a few other populations that I visited in the Cook Street of New Zealand between the North Island and the South Island, we found that a lot of the Northern Island populations had really balanced sex ratios. Um, in fact, we're even uh, leaning toward female bias populations, which of course is really good for the population viability of each of these particular locations. I circled uh, North Brother Island here, and we had another population that was a reintroduced population um, where we had some concerns about what the survival of the tuatara on that population we're looking at over time and identified that island as another one where we might wanna continue to follow up and do more regular surveys to see what the sex ratio might look like over time. The other positive news uh, for Tuatara is there are a lot of people uh, in the Department of Conservation and research universities all across New Zealand who are working really hard to make sure this species continues into the future. So there have been several translocations onto islands that have had predators removed, and those are indicated here in the map in orange, as well as some mainland sanctuaries where um, either uh, peninsulas or nature reserves have been fenced and the introduced mammal predators excluded, and populations of tuatara have been reintroduced in those places as well. Notably, uh, a population has been reintroduced on the South Island as well. And this is a great opportunity both for the general public to get to see uh, tuatara in nature, as well as think about what the outlook might be for reintroduction of tuatara on the mainland across a larger scale as the predator control efforts uh, continue. So sort of the overall take homes from my work was that this one particular island where we have a lot of long-term data on tuatara population provides a cause for concern and an example of how a species with temperature-dependent sex determination might be impacted under climate change. 
Um, the population structure and body condition of Northern Island Tuatara populations appears to be stable compared to survey data that I looked at from the 1980s and 1990s, but it's really important to continue to monitor these islands, both to make sure invasive predators don't get on them and to make sure these islands uh, stay stable into the future. And maintaining these current protections of these offshore islands is really vital, not only to Tuatara conservation, but to protecting all this other incredible biodiversity of plants and animals and other organisms that are found uh, in New Zealand. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank um, the Maori tribes that are the guardians of these species that have permitted us and worked with us and collaborated with us on the design of these studies, as well as the New Zealand Department of Conservation, uh, Victoria University of Wellington that host, hosted me, um, my postdoc advisor, Nicola Nelson, and long-term researchers in the Tuatara Research Group, Sue Keel and Charles Daughtery. I had a lot of um, amazing scientists that I worked with who volunteered their time to join me on these surveys. And the funding for this work was provided by the National Science Foundation in the US, uh, which provided an international postdoctoral fellowship, as well as the Dallas Zoo, Toledo Zoo, and St. Louis Zoo that are invested in the long-term conservation of Tuatara in particular. Um, thank you so much for joining me to hear about this work and I'm excited to take any questions that you guys might uh, type in now. And please feel free to contact me if you have any additional uh, questions at a later time as well. Thank you, Christine, that was great. Thank you, Christine. You're welcome. That was really interesting. It was fascinating to see these giant reptiles that you got to work with. Yes, they're a really special part of the biodiversity uh, that's left in New Zealand. So I have a kind of a overarching question to kick us off. Um, as a young person, how did you know that you wanted to study reptiles specifically? And how did that passion lead you to where you are now with your education and your career? Oh, that's a great question. Um, growing up, I loved being outside. And when I went to college, I wasn't sure about doing research versus doing something like environmental law. And I discovered I liked being outdoors a lot more than I liked doing paperwork. Um, and so like any kid, I dreamed of being that researcher on the African savanna studying large mammals. And I really quickly learned that the logistics of studying um, some of those really big species um, are is difficult. It's hard to get to capture enough individuals for your study. Um, there's often a lot of um, additional permits that have to go into uh, studying those species. And so when I was in college, I started working in the lab of a professor there who studied snakes and turtles. And I never ever thought of myself as someone who would go around catching snakes. Um, but the more I did it, the more I uh, loved being outdoors and realized all the potential kinds of questions you can ask when you study a smaller organism like an amphibian or a reptile. Uh, and so I got my start studying turtles and salamanders um, and then decided uh, that I was still going to try to try to try to travel the world a little bit in uh, my research pursuits and met um, the scientist at Victoria University at a conference and mentioned um, the kind of work that I was interested in. They said, oh yeah, when you get done your degree, uh, why don't you think about coming over and doing a project with us? And I kept it in the back of my mind for eight years until I finished my graduate work and then wrote the grant proposal that um, allowed me and my family to go over there to work, which was a really special opportunity. Um, so it really just started from a love of being outdoors and realizing that that could be a research career. And now I teach at University of Richmond and my job is to both bring these cool projects to students and uh, get them catching turtles and salamanders and appreciating the natural world and thinking about how we protect it into the future. Wow, that's it's fascinating. You can take a love of something and turn it into such a specific career. It's really cool to have come full circle as an undergraduate uh, catching that huge snapping turtle uh, at Davidson College in North Carolina. Now I take my own students out to our campus lake here in Virginia and we catch turtles um, and it's a lot of fun. Mm. And so I wanted to ask you a fun question. Uh, we saw in the photo you holding one of the Tuatara, I believe. And yes. what was that like? It was, it's intimidating. They move faster than you think 
they might. Uh, they are quite, even though it's a cool climate and they're ectothermic, which means uh, they don't generate their own heat when it's nice and warm out, they skitter along really fast. And I found out that some populations are um, more chill and easy to catch them than others. Those northern populations where it's a lot warmer, they moved incredibly fast. Uh, so you're kind of doing a delicate dance while you're trying to catch them. There's all kinds of um, seabirds and insects that breed on these islands and you're trying to be so careful not to step on any of them and injure any of the habitat while you're also trying to do, kind of like you see on the Nature Channel, pounce on top of them and uh, grab them uh, behind the head so that you don't get bitten. Um, oh, wow. There's more to it uh, that I learned over time, but not that different than catching a salamander, just a little bigger and faster. Right. Interesting. Must be incredible to hold such a rare animal. It, it was a life changing experience. So once in a lifetime opportunity for sure. Wow. So um, this question is from Mari, one of our um, youngest watchers from our Headwaters family. What is your favorite herp? Oh, great question, Mari. Thank you so much. Um, in the US, my first love was painted turtles uh, and then red spotted newts are one of my other favorites. Um, and you might've seen those wandering around forests um, in their bright red juvenile stage. It's called an eft, a red eft. Um, so you may have seen those in forests around the uh, Northeast. They have a really cool toxin called tetrodotoxin, which makes them noxious to predators. And so they have that bright red color to tell other species, hey, I'm not so good to eat, I'm not very tasty. And so it makes it really cool for us to see and um, uh, to keep them safe from predators. And so that, that was one of my uh, first favorites, um, but it's really hard to pick a particular one. Mm. Great, thank you. Um, so I had a question going back to the tuatara. Uh, the populations that you noticed on the offshore islands. I wonder if you have any idea what those populations might have looked like a couple hundred years ago. Oh, that's a great question. Well, the wonderful thing about these offshore islands is they look really similar to 100 plus years ago because people don't live on these islands. And so they're really um, protected from a lot of the changes that we see around uh, the habitats around us. So I always think um, I'm in Virginia now and when I look at photos of what the mountains and the forests around here looked like two or three hundred years ago versus what they looked like hundreds of years ago, it's really startling to think that all the forests around me have regrown over the last couple hundred years after early European settlers basically cut them all down um, for timber and uh, mining purposes. Um, so that's why these offshore islands in New Zealand are particularly incredible because they're not that different from the habitats uh, that once were across um, the whole main islands of New Zealand. Mm. Um, but one thing that really stands out is just the density of organisms. Um, these seabirds congregate in these huge groups. Uh, the reptiles in the most um, dense populations, you can just see burrow after burrow after burrow. That that little island I showed, uh, North Brother Island, had uh, has up to 500 tuatara on it at any given point. So you just walk out at night and it just comes alive when it's moist and warm and hot. Um, there is just teeming with, with life. Wow. And so I wonder if you can project at all or sort of retro project um, if the uh, difference between the male and female populations would have been more even, even maybe going back farther than a few hundred years. Is that something you have a sense of? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so when a species has something like a huge island, just like the whole North Island of New Zealand to roam across, there can be sort of lots of reasons that the population might become biased one direction or the other. Uh, it could just be uh, a chance event that survival was low of males versus females. But in a big, when there's a lot of space and a huge population size, that you really just don't see a lot of fluctuation over time. It kind of all evens out. But when you have a small population that's completely isolated, some factor that might just be one year there happened to be really poor female survival uh, become, can become amplified over time. Uh, and there's not an opportunity for more females to migrate in. Um, so we don't know exactly all the particular factors. Uh, it might have been a particularly extreme climactic year, but these things can sort of amplify over time. Um, 
So again, in the original kinds of population of the Tuatara, when there's tons of them, there's lots of space, the females could dig nests of lots of different depths or pick uh, to nest under a tree versus out in the open, you would get a lot more um, variation year to year and you'd see that variation kind of evening out. Um, but when you have such a tiny little microcosm with a small population, one thing gets out of tilt and it um, can amplify over time. Interesting. So it sounds like the size of the population can determine those factors as well. Definitely. Large populations are a lot. And that's why when species get down to just, you know, 50 or 100 individuals, um, it's really nerve wracking because one one small thing, one one bad year of reproduction, one um, introduced rat that swims over to that island can just devastate that population. So that's why we like to see populations get back to big self-sustaining numbers where we can feel confident that they'll persist over time. That makes sense. And so we know that you have moved into teaching as well. Um, someone would like to know what projects are you working on with your students at the University of Richmond? Oh, great question. Thank you so much. Um, we have a long-term population study going on here as well. Right now I'm working on the redback salamander as part of a big research network across a lot of different universities and nature centers across the Northeast. Everybody's trying to use the same methods to gather population information about the redback salamander because it's a really common species um, for those living in the Northeast of the United States. You might've seen them under logs or rocks. And so by having a big group of people all studying the same species in the same way, we can gather some of that same information about how the populations are doing all across the range um, and over time, particularly as our world is getting a little bit warmer. I also work, uh, as was mentioned at the beginning, on an invasive caterpillar now called the gypsy moth, um, which is a really devastating invasive species on forest canopies, also in um, the eastern part of the United States. I think it's really important to have projects here that students who are at the University of Richmond coming to study can get their hands um, uh, on into the field. And so we're looking to see how southern populations of gypsy moth are growing as they encounter warmer climates. So that's a, a big theme of the work I'm doing now is when species encounter warmer climates, how do they grow and persist? And for something like the gypsy moth, we're wondering how far they can spread. And for something like the red-backed salamander, we're wondering how those populations can hang on into the future. Mm, very interesting work. Thank you. Um, yeah, and so you talked with me a little bit before we went live about how your work has involved a lot of travel and you mentioned um, some awesome opportunities to contact rare species. What is your favorite part of the work that you do? Oh my gosh, well the travel is certainly a huge perk when I get the opportunity to either visit researchers in other countries and collaborate and uh, work with them, um, getting to um, visit places and, and find animals that are um, you know, not the thing you would see every day in your backyard. Uh, I think visiting those really um, protected and rare places and seeing um, species congregating in um, some of our natural areas, I think is uh, one of my favorite parts of my job. Um, the other favorite part of my job is getting to work with students and inspire, I hope others to go into conservation and protecting natural resources, whether it's just an appreciation for uh, nature and whatever career you go into and students who might want to um, be professional biologists or wildlife ecologists. So what does conservation look like on the ground level? If you're watching and you um, kind of believe in the cause, but maybe don't know where to get started, what would you recommend for the average person? Yeah, I think for the average person, learning the species that are around you just in your backyard, even if you live in a really urban area, there are uh, species that you probably don't know about right in your backyard or in adjacent natural areas. And so finding out, um, who's doing projects and um, opportunities for volunteering is a great place to start. There's also a lot of cool apps out there right now for making your own observations and learning about the species around you with lots of experts that want to chime in and help you. One of them is called iNaturalist. So you can download that on a phone or iPad and take pictures of the species that you see around it 
And when you submit your observations of things you see around you, you're contributing that data to scientists who want to study is this species found in this particular place? Um, because we recognize that one person can't go around and visit all the places where all these different animals are found. So a lot of science now is done by crowdsourcing and what's called citizen science and finding out what's in your backyard and submitting that information so it goes into a really big database that informs us uh, about um, how species are doing all over uh, the world. So I think just getting educated on what's around you and finding local opportunities to volunteer is a really good place to start if you're interested in, in getting involved and learning some uh, things about the species in your own backyard. That's great. I'm glad you brought up the idea of citizen science. We love iNaturalist and we did a little mini lesson on it. If you're watching and want to know more, you can check out one of our Friday videos in our library. Uh, it's a, just a great way to participate in science right from your home. Yeah, and if you're not near the Headwater Science Institute, there are other groups like Master Naturalists and other organizations probably close to you that would be thrilled to um, let you experience um, nature in your backyard. Living in Richmond, Virginia, I love the James River and any opportunity I can get to get out with my daughter to uh, just sit and watch nature. I always see something interesting in the little rock pool or in the crevice of a tree. Um, when we're dodging the poison ivy and other things. So get educated about um, how to be outdoors safely in your particular area too. Yes, great advice from Dr. Christine Grayson and a wonderful talk. Thank you so much for joining us. We're gonna wrap up here, but um, if you are just tuning in, uh, Lunch with the Scientist is your opportunity to get to know a working professional scientist if you'd like to help sponsor, or if you know another scientist that wants to reach out to students with your work, please let us know. And Dr. Christine Grayson, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, have a good day.